Now you may be wondering, why on earth am I wearing my favourite apron today? Well, if you keep watching, you'll find out that it is completely aligned with today's theme. And welcome to another episode of Boring History. My name is Angela and one of my favourite things to do whilst going for a walk is to listen to an audiobook. In particular, crime fiction. And recently I've been listening to this series where the main character, who's a private detective, has the name Cormoran. And turns out that Cormoran is actually the name of a mythical giant, so how could I not make a video on him? Also. I don't think I need to mention that this video is clearly not sponsored by Audible, right? Anyway, let's get started and hear the story of Cormoran, the Cornish giant. Now, what I found out whilst researching for this topic is that often when we hear of stories or myths that are concerning giants, they're actually told as a way of explaining natural phenomenon. Phenomena. Natural phenomena. So for example, if there's a hill that has rocks all over the place, it's because two giants were having an upgraded version of a snowball fight. So with that in mind, it perhaps comes as no surprise that today's story, which of course focuses on a giant, is set in a small rocky island called St. Michael's Mound. This is a tidal island, which means that during low tide, you can actually walk along this type of sandy causeway and get there via foot. Now, I haven't personally been there, but judging by the photos on Google, it does actually look like quite an interesting place to visit and explore. I mean, they've even got a medieval castle and a church. What's not to love? Have you been there? If yes, let me know how it is in the comment section down below. Now, there's actually a rumour about St. Michael's Mound. And the rumour says that once upon a time, St. Michael's Mound wasn't actually an island at all. Instead, it was just a rocky patch of ground that was surrounded by a forest. And the reason that it became this mound of sorts is thanks to the remnants of the actions of a giant by the name of Cormoran. Now, as far as giants go, Cormoran was huge. He was larger than Hagrid and taller than all of the trees in the forest. He had a big bushy beard and beady little eyes. And also, he wasn't all that nice. He did, however, have a wife, and her name was Chameleon. Now, she was also a giant, but she didn't have a beard. What she did have was a lovely little... Well, actually, I wouldn't say little because she was a giant. But what she did have was a lovely big apron that she had sewn herself and was immensely proud of. Which, you know, I can understand because imagine how hard it would have been to find all the fabric for an apron that would fit somebody that was taller than a tree. But anyway, and now that our introductions are all out of the way, let's get on with our story. One day, Cormoran was just lounging in the forest, leaning against a fallen tree as a backrest and sucking on some bones from some leftover sheep that he had stolen quite recently from some local farmers. Now, Cormoran, pretty tired. It was a nice day, the sun was shining, and all he wanted to do was have a little doze. However, every single time that he went to close his eyes, some pesky little human from the neighbouring village would interrupt him. They were shouting, trying to sell their fish, children were screeching, and it sounded like a whole family of pigs were just having a reunion nearby. He scratches his beard and he says, You know what, Chameleon? I want to build a stronghold. Chameleon is like, Yes, dear, whatever you want, I'll go get the axe and we can knock down some trees. Cormoran jumps up from his sitting position and he's like, No, you idiot, you can't make a stronghold out of trees. I want one made out of granite. Chameleon sighs and she's like, Now, are you sure that's really a realistic aspiration to have? I mean, the granite quarry is very far away and we're going to have to walk all the way there and all the way back, carrying all these ridiculously heavy rocks. Why don't we just use greenstone instead? I mean, that's nearby and it's going to be so much easier to get. Cormoran scrunches up his face in disgust and says, Greenstone is for peasants. Stop being so lazy. A stronghold has to be strong and it has to be made of granite. So we're just going to have to make several trips up and down to the quarry over several days. Chameleon doesn't look convinced and she's like, yeah, but how are we going to carry all this granite? 
We'll use the pockets in your apron, of course, Cormorant says. Chameleon is aghast. Surely that's going to break my apron. But Cormorant had had enough and he roars, you're just trying to be lazy and get out of getting me my granite. I don't want to hear another word out of you. Let's go to the quarry. Chameleon sighs, but she knows better than to get into an argument with her husband when he gets into one of his little moods. So she just quietly follows him all the way to the granite quarry. And the two of them spend an entire week collecting granite and bringing it all the way back to their forest home. There are piles and piles of granite everywhere. So by the end of the week, they start constructing the base of the stronghold. However, once all the granite has been used up, the stronghold is barely tall enough to cover their ankles. Chameleon starts muttering to herself about how ridiculous her stupid husband is, and she devises a cunning plan. Next week, when they continue their granite collecting, she's going to smuggle in some of the closer and lighter green stone. She figures if she hides it underneath some of the granite, Cormorant won't even notice in his hurry to build up the stronghold's walls. So, the following week, she puts her plan into action, and whilst Cormorant is having a light little nap in between granite collecting trips, she sneaks off to the much closer greenstone stash. Unfortunately, just as she is hiding the greenstone underneath some of the granite rocks, Cormoran wakes up and he catches her red-handed. Or perhaps we should say green-handed. He roars at her. What do you think you're doing? How dare you try to weaken the integrity of my stronghold with this nonsense inferior rock. I told you that we are only to use granite. So go and collect all of that green stone and take it back to where you found it. Chameleon rolls her eyes, but... She appeases her husband and collects all the greenstone and puts it back into the pocket of her apron ready to carry back to the greenstone pile. Unfortunately, as she's walking back towards the greenstone's home, the strings of her apron snap and all of the greenstone falls into a big massive pile onto the ground. At this point, Chameleon has had enough. Her favourite apron that she worked so hard on is broken. Her husband has been a complete grumpy head for the last fortnight. And she's like, do you know what? That stupid pile of greenstone can stay right where it is. And apparently that pile of greenstone is now called Chapel's Rock. And you can actually still see it today where you catch the ferry to get across to St. Michael's Mount. Anyway, eventually Cormoran's stronghold is complete. It's made entirely out of granite and it rises high above the tops of the trees. Cormoran is extremely pleased with himself because now those irritating humans from the village down below have no chance of bothering him. The villagers, however, are not at all impressed with this giant mound of granite that's rising high above the treetops. Mostly because now if Cormoran decides to borrow any of their sheep or pig or cows for his dinner, well, they have no way of getting up to the top of his stronghold and reclaiming their animals. The villagers are all like, whoa, it's us. What are we going to do? We're going to starve to death because the evil Cormoran is going to steal all of our livestock. Who will save us? Enter Jack, a strapping young lad who decides to teach this grumpy giant a lesson. He digs an enormous pit along the causeway that leads to Cormoran's stronghold and he covers it with twigs and dirt so that it's hidden from view. He then strolls across to the base of Cormoran's stronghold and blows his horn. Obviously he couldn't shout because, you know, the window's so high up there's no way that Cormoran would have heard him. Cormoran does, however, hear the horn. In fact, it wakes him up. And he's furious. He's gone to all this effort to build his stronghold so those pesky little humans with their pesky little sounds can't bother him. And now one of them is right at his doorstep, still making a racket. How dare some numpty have the audacity to blow a horn and wake him up from his sleep. He leans out the window and screams at Jack, what on earth do you think you're doing? Jack blows a raspberry and he's like, I bet you can't catch me. And he starts running back towards the causeway. Cormoran sprints down the stairs of his stronghold and he's hot on Jack's heels. And just as he's about to catch him, Jack swerves to the right. Cormoran, unfortunately, can't change directions quite as quickly as little Jack can. And 
he ends up falling right into the trap that had been set for him. Cormoran lands with a thump and he glares up to the top of the pit to where Jack is standing. Jack crosses his arms with a self-satisfied smirk and he said, I hope you've learnt your lesson. Don't you even think about stealing any of our livestock ever again. And he ambers away, leaving Cormoran to presumably be saved by his wife. And that's the end of the story. Now, just in case you missed it, because I didn't make the connection clear enough, St. Michael's Mound, I think, is like the leftover remains of Cormoran's ginormous stronghold. And if you heard the name Jack and instantly thought Beanstalk, you would be correct. Thank you so much for joining me for today's little story. I hope you've enjoyed it. I know there are different versions floating around out there, so if you have heard a different version, please feel free to share it in the comment section down below. Otherwise, I hope you'll consider subscribing because I look forward to sharing even more boring history with you in the future.